All right, welcome back for another episode of Talk to Tatiana. And this is Tatiana Sawyer, and I'm happy to welcome Barry Molesdale. Uh, Barry, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Tatiana. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, of course. Um, awesome. I love connecting with entrepreneurs. I love to connect with people who help and support entrepreneurs um, in their own way and so um, in businesses. And so tell, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you are in the world. Sure. Uh, Barry Molesdale. I'm actually located in a small town called Oakville, Ontario, about 20 minutes west of downtown Toronto, uh, the wonderful uh, country of Canada. Uh, I was born in Liverpool, England, and have grown up most of my life and lived in Canada. Uh, as to what do I do for a living, um, my main priority or focus or passion is probably the rest, the best word, is two things. One, it's bringing more joy to people's work lives and doing that through building tomorrow's leaders in business today. And how do you do that? Uh, we are an executive leadership coaching organization that also offers support for executives in transition. It actually started about 15 years ago uh, as a proper business consulting company, which led me into numerous different organizations that had specific types of business challenges. And uh, I was in and had experience in relatable industries and companies. So as that evolved, uh, I would often find myself, you know, solving problems that companies had for them, which may have led to future employment with the company to see it further implemented. Um, but pre-COVID, I sort of pivoted my priority, if you will, because I have had an executive coach of my own for the last 12 to 13 years. And before COVID happened, I started to think about how do I take the success and the enjoyment and the culture improvement, which led to really good business results in organizations I worked in and for, and how do I expand that to affect a broader audience? And then as COVID hit, it really came to the realization for me that we're taking a much more reflective look upon the importance of work in our lives. And if we're going to do what we do, we should really enjoy the people we work with. We should really enjoy the culture that companies are creating. And I'm a huge proponent that people come first. And if you get the right culture and you get the right leadership approach, the results will take care of themselves versus being result focused and talking the talk, but not necessarily walking the walk in terms of how important people are to an organization's success. So I, I work closely with my executive coach. I figured out through a lot of exercises what really was my passion. Um, and then I went out and got my coaching certifications and a number of different intellectual properties that I utilize. I formed uh, what I would define as, you know, an organizational and an individual coaching syllabus that I follow. And I've been reaching out to people in my network and not within my network just to really understand what are their needs? How can I help them? And, and really, for me, it's the intrinsic satisfaction of seeing that awakening that a lot of leaders go through based on or a comparison to what they may necessarily have been aware of before our engagements. And so how um, what do you what would you say is the kind of the most frequent mindset shift that you um, that your clients experience? What would you say is the belief for. Uh, maybe something that they come to you and they change after working with you for some time. Well, if I mean, if it's more than one thing, absolutely share that too. No, that, that's a great question. And I, and I think the challenge in leadership is two things. One, we don't really ever go to school for it, right? We learn a lot of IQ skills in high school. We refine them with a specific potential career direction when we go to postgraduate you know, university, you know, and depending on the area of expertise, we go even further down that road with an MBA or specific types of schooling. But as I find and talk to numerous managers who do it for the first time, or those that have done it for a number of years, unless you're at a very high senior executive level, 
companies don't necessarily tend to invest in their high performing opportunity leaders of tomorrow. Right. You always hear of, and I was I was opportunistically beneficial to this. You often hear of companies looking at their corporate executive leadership and finding third party companies or third party schooling with which they can send them to refine and improve those EQ and leadership skills with the hope or intention that it cascades down into the organization. But what I find is it doesn't. And, and the, the director level and the manager level and all of those types of people who have aspiration to get to that corporate level, it's often only based on results they can put on the board and or the office politics that they may generally tend to play. So the challenge for me with clients is that self-awareness. A lot of managers I talk to have struggling teams whether that's pressure coming from their boss above them to continuously hit performance results, whether that's them having to dive in and solve problems for their team members and just do it themselves to get it done, whether that's experiencing turnover they didn't anticipate and having empty seats on their team, which obviously creates a different level of stress for those that remain. Um, So the reasoning or rationale is usually result-based or something doesn't seem as flowing or as good as they've seen it before. But the realization that people go through once we talk and connect, is not that there's any flaw or issue that are causing these results, but the realization they go through is maybe it's actually not the team that I have and it's something I could do better. So, Getting people to look in the mirror ahead of time to then see the opportunity in front of them is probably the hardest part. I agree. I think it is the hardest part. I mean, it's certainly, and I don't know if that's the case. This is just my my thoughts, um, that oftentimes people get to be to grow in the corporate ranks um, and grow to into sort of leadership positions because they're a little bit more, uh, I mean, I'm kind of giving here a psychological diagnosis term, but it's really not narcissistic and that, you know, there is narcissistic qualities, which is great. I mean, narcissists are the one who rule the world in a way, but, and make things happen. Um, we're, and I'm not talking about necessarily super narcissists, like kind of the extreme case, but you have to have some of those qualities to be a leader, to be promoted. And oftentimes that could also, the flip side of that could be um, really not um, not really be, being self-aware, like exactly. knowing it all. And it's funny you say that because, you know, there's almost a dichotomy at work there, right? those that play the corporate game and socialize corporately up and make want to make themselves seen and present, whether it's in conversation, in meetings, in social settings that are created for them in a corporate environment, there are those that are better playing the game and self-promoting. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? You want to get seen, you want to get noticed, right? But conversely, It's those that sign up to do the extra work or to take on the projects because they are generally motivated by the success of the company and their peers and everybody around them. And those are people are the furthest thing from narcissists. And and ironically, when those quote unquote more narcissistic or self-centered people get those promotions, they get to what I would define as that glass ceiling in the capability to go further. And that's really because, and again, it's not a generality, but it's a observation honed over multiple years for both of us, right? They lack that self-awareness or EQ to be able to relate to and understand others and put themselves in other people's shoes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think for me, the hardest part when working with clients who have the most potential to be the leaders that they want to be or they never thought they never thought they could be, um, but now they see that kind of a, as a, as an opportunity, as a possibility, I guess. 
the hardest part is having them look in the mirror and admit that they don't know everything. For it, for me, I mean, I'm certainly, I certainly have narcissistic traits, uh, and I certainly, you know, be, <laughs> well, some more than others, but I certainly have my share. But at the same time, as soon as I uh, catch myself thinking I know everything. I bring myself back to say, I don't know anything. And that's the, for I, what I found is that to be a better position when working with clients, when, mm -hmm. when talking to other people, I assume I don't know anything. And then uh, the conversation becomes much more interesting. And then I get to see what I maybe don't love about myself and, um, and the leader that I don't want to be, because, you know, I study psychology um, uh, on my, on the weekends <laughs> And what I, a part of it is when something triggers you, right? They teach you in psychology, when something triggers you, some, another person doing X, Y, and Z or saying X, Y, and Z, that means that there is a reflection of that inside of you. If, if you had neutral position about something, about an event or, or an opinion or whatever it is, um, then you, you wouldn't get triggered by that thing, whatever it is, right? But if you have something that typically means that either you have that in you and you hate it or you love it um, or, and you don't, and you, um, you really notice it because you love it, right? I mean, it works in life also. It's empathy, just like anything. You can feel what another person feels because let's say you've been through that or you've seen it up close or whatever. So well, very important funny. thing. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because one of the key foundation elements of our intellectual property that we work on with our clients is really helping them become more reflective instead of reflexive. And I'll give you some data points to help you understand this and then for the audience. 95% uh, of people, when asked straight up, do you see yourself as a reflexive leader or a reflective leader? meaning they're more thinking and more supportive, 95% of them will answer reflectively slash servant, if you will, because they want to be perceived as that and they're aspiring to be that. However, when we work with these clients, myself and other coaches who use the same syllabus and intellectual property, 99% of the people that we videotape for the very first time in their very first role play all fail a very simple business scenario of them talking to one of their employees in a role play, in a safe environment, in a school or training environment. They all fail it the first time or 99%. I've only ever seen two videos in all the ones that I have access to in this company's database of people that got it right the first time. And that's what we really describe as people don't have, or they have an unconscious incompetence to thinking they do things one way when and ultimately they don't. And it's the role playing that makes this become a conscious incompetence because now they've done it and they've seen the tape and they go, oh my God, I had no idea. I'm like, yes. And if you had no idea in a training environment, you're not reflecting upon your behavior and you have no idea you're actually doing it to solve problems and get them off your plate versus reflectively, and you mentioned it before, psychologically, coming to a conversation without the presumption or intention to be right. Most people go into a meeting, let's call it, you know, sales versus operations, which is a classic, right? The sales leader comes into a meeting and all, ultimately the customer frustration, he's going to blame on operations. Operations is going to come into that meeting with lots of data points and lots of emails and lots of facts, and they want to point the finger at sales. And it's never productive. Yeah. And you never come out of it with a harmonious approach or an action plan that people are going to own, own jointly. So what we teach people is how to structure conversation, whether it's with your, your team members, whether it's with your manager up, whether it's cross-functional across different teams. But ultimately, the point is, how do I structure myself with a mindset to be in an open and listening forum by setting the tone for the conversation properly with structuring statements, 
for giving listening statements as they're going into the conversation and making sure they're showing that they're hearing the other person's perspective openly and honestly without a preconceived notion that the what they're hearing is wrong and they're going to walk out no matter come hell or high water with their opinion and their attitude being right. And then ultimately, respectfully, not necessarily assuming the other person is right, but giving data to make sure that they are heard as well and then coming to a mutual agreement. Now, in theory, that sounds simple and most people probably think they do it each and every day, but the reality is, is that they don't. So it's really having people offer us trust and offer that awareness in self that, Hey, you know what? Leadership is a skill. It's a muscle. We have to continue to evolve it. Right. I love the line that even the world's best athletes all have coaches. All the world's best executives all have coaches. I myself, still to this day, 12 or 13 years later, still have a coach that I work with. Right. A lot of therapists, if you think about psychology, which is a passion of yours. I don't know a therapist I've ever met that doesn't have a therapist of their own. They all do. We all know it. Yeah, absolutely. So it just goes to show for me that if people are really wanting to develop their tool belt and their skill sets, right, there comes a point in time in your evolution of reading or of, you know, blogging on the internet or doing research about leadership or reading lots of books. Those are all very theoretical. and There often is some case studies. The only one I generally like to refer to or gauge my clients with is John Maxwell's five levels of leadership. It's very simple. It's very on point. It's are you a one, two, three, four, or five? And these, this is how you're defined. And, and take a hard look in the mirror and let me know, based on these quick one sentence evaluations, where would you see yourself? And most people honestly come back to me and say, yeah, I'm about a two or three. I'm like, okay, great. If you want to stay there your whole career, good luck. But if you want to evolve to a four, and then you want to put it in practice, which is the true determination of success, when you put it in practice and we continue to evolve that longer term after the intensity of work is done, you will evolve if you have the passion for it to become a five. Because I know when I started working with my executive coach, I probably would have rated myself as a two and a half. Fantastic operator was told by lots of bosses, put great results on the board, fixed organizations. But because I was initially hired as a consultant, my headspace going into that was fix and perform and measure. And I, being outside of the organization, didn't have to worry or be as concerned about the cultural or people impact of what I was hired to do. But as soon as I started with the company, I didn't have the self-awareness to pivot that prioritization to the human capital and human relationship. So one of my bosses came to me after he hired me and said, you're one of the best operators I've ever had. But, and I went, uh-oh, here comes a big but. I can tell by the tone of his voice. And he had a great way of massaging things. He was very self-aware and a great leader. And he said, but if you want to cross that bridge to true leadership and become a four or five, you need to stop leaving dead bodies along the way in getting your aspiration to get the result. So that really started my own leadership journey. And I had to put in a lot of hard work, a lot of self-awareness, listen to a lot of criticism, knowing that it wasn't an attack, but it was feedback that helps you understand because all of us have blind spots. And it's just becoming aware of those things that are, Assessing who you are as your starting point, teaching you the foundation, evolving that through additional experiences and emotional intelligence and practice and practice and fail, right? One of the things I do with every single client, we start every single weekly call with, tell me the two best times you were your best self last week. Give me 30 seconds of when you felt you were at your best, two examples. And then we follow with, all right. Well, we're never all perfect. Give me some examples of your worst. And what we're looking for is factors that influence that. 
because there are a lot of considerable external factors and influencers. So it's helping them become consciously aware of what allows them to be their best and what prevents them from being their best. And then we continue that evolution and continue to work together. That's really good. I like it. Um, I think kind of bringing that up and having them self-reflect um, is a powerful, powerful um, tool. Absolutely. Well, everyone is in our class, right? We've all been to great seminars. We've all been to great one-day sessions. We've all heard tremendous guest speakers. But nothing yeah. ever gets, as we all like to call it, sticky unless you practice it and then have a sounding board by which to bounce it off of and know, am I actually learning? Am I actually getting continuous feedback? Not necessarily only on am I being better, but hey, when I did my leadership circle 360 and my Hogan assessment, just a couple of scientific tools that I've used, I had two or three very specific blind spots. So we had to dig a lot deeper into a lot of other tools that I use that I have gone through myself to figure out why the blind spot. And I think, you know, one of the things we always ask one another is, you know, what advice would you give yourself 10 or 15 years ago that you know now that you didn't know then? Right. And and for me, it would be stop playing a role that you think is how to achieve success and be your true authentic self. And for me, I'm a very natural introvert that's very fact based. And I've learned all the assessment tools and all the, you know, different types of personalities that are out there. And I've learned that it's exhausting of energy for me on a day-to-day basis to flex myself to relate to different personality styles. But I enjoy doing it, and now I'm coming at it from an authentic position. Before, I used to go into the office or go into a client, and literally I could feel myself the moment I walked in the front door almost putting on a hat and playing a role that I thought the audience wanted me to play or that I needed to play to be a little bit more gregarious, to be a little bit more outgoing, to be a a lot more conversational because introverts are perceived as being lesser than. And being very fact-based didn't open yourself up to really caring or listening and understanding the emotions that half the world feelers bring into their work life. So that would really be the advice that I would have given myself then to sort of speed up the journey to where I obviously am today at this stage of my life. It would have been wonderful to be there 15 or 20 years ago when I wasn't. I know exactly how you feel. Absolutely. (laughs) And so how do you work with people? Meaning typically and here, so here's kind of my thought process on this. Uh, what I've noticed is that the hardest part is not just having people look in the mirror, so to speak, become self-aware, but also understand that they need a coach. Like everybody needs a coach. Everybody needs an advisor, right. um, kind of a, their beck and call or whatever, whatever the expression is, right? Um, but how do you actually... Like if someone is listening and they're at X stage, they've experienced these and these feelings, emotions, or maybe they don't experience anything. Maybe they think they're already a great leader. Um, where are they now to make them perfect to work with, with someone like you, with you? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I would say, I would answer that in a couple of ways. One, I would say Google John Maxwell's five levels of leadership. Read, read the five levels. They're very simple, right? Who follows you? What followership you have and why, right? Is it because your boss put you in a job and you got the job? That's a level one, right? Is it because your boss has credibility with the team and he chose to hire you and now they're working for you? That's level two, right? Have you, have you achieved some tangible result? That's level three and so on and so forth. So, If people can have that very quick and simple reflection 
they'll probably s- soon come to realize I'm a two or a three. If I'm really new and first time manager, I'm probably a one. Well, then you probably need a lot more help quicker so that you succeed and make a very good first impression. But then I would say to people, you know what? Who's the best leader you've ever worked for and why? And what are those characteristics? And you can't just mimic them because that's been that other person's entire life journey, right? I started a leadership interview series back in the fall simply because I wanted to connect with those I viewed as great leaders and look for, is there commonality? There's not commonality in personality type for sure. There is absolutely commonality in self-awareness. There's commonality in authenticity. But again, every single one of those people I talk to has had a coach and a mentor and gone to considerable leadership development courses over the course of their career. Some have done it more than others, depending on their aspiration and their intrinsic motivation to succeed. So for me, my advice would be to anybody, it never hurts to have a conversation. What you're going to get out of it is the amount of effort you put into it, right? Just because you have an opportunity to improve and be better at what you do doesn't necessarily mean that you're not good at what you do today. And and I always use the sports analogy for that, right? Kobe Bryant as a great example, or Michael Jordan as another great example, you know, may Kobe rest in peace. First one in the gym, always work the hardest, always put in the work. And these are guys making multiple million dollars a year, tons of different endorsements, winning MVP trophies and titles. And it wasn't because they couldn't get better. You can always get better. So it's taking something, I think, in an outside interest or hobby or observational world and thinking, okay, does that apply to me? Can I be better at what it is I do? And if the answer is yes, because everybody can, then it becomes a matter of, okay, what's the how? And, and, And the wonderful thing about my approach, because I'm intrinsically motivated to help people is whether you want to work together for three months, six months, nine months, you know, do all the intense and intentional work and then maintain a longer retainer, as you mentioned earlier, access relationship that is less frequent because you may or may not have certain situations that come up and you need a sounding board occasionally or periodically, that's fine too. But I think you have to put in the work in the front end that's relatively intensive and be prepared to do that to then be able to see the fruits of your labor and and how you will see things like team productivity, team culture, results improve, KPI consistency improve, right? It's actually able to be tangibly measured even though we're working on what most people would define as a soft skill. You can absolutely tangibly see the fruits of that labor downstream when you put in the work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Barry, um, it's been really a pleasure to listen to you share um, these leadership uh, nuggets. Um, I think there that people listening definitely took something away, took a few things away. And, and I think even if someone listening is working for somebody else, I think Leadership is a thing that it doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't even matter if you're in a leadership position. You can be like somebody who's in a work a workhorse or whatever, right? And if you treat it as with the with that leadership attitude, I think it's uh, it's important. And I've certainly seen it happen. Uh, my my husband is that way. He's intrinsically a leader, and um, even though he works as a project manager, it's still and he could have been much more than that. Uh, the title doesn't matter to him. What matters is um, having a certain routine, but also treating others with respect and treating others how he would like to be treated as well. And and, and, it, and it sounds simple. It's funny you say that, right? My first leadership role was at eight years old when I was named the captain of the first soccer team I ever played for. Nice. So I guess in theory... <laughs> I've been doing this for the majority of my life, but didn't know it. Yeah. 
right? But to your point, leaders come in all different shapes or sizes, and nothing of leadership should ever relate to a title or a role or a responsibility that you have. It's really about self-improvement and contributing in any way, shape, or form you can to your own intrinsic satisfaction, your own intrinsic development. And again, as I mentioned off the top, I love bringing joy to people's work lives. We do it eight or 10 or 12 hours a day. You know, the pandemic woke us up to, do we really love what we're doing and should we pivot more to something we enjoy even more because life is short, right? So you can bring joy to that environment, whether you're the leader, whether you're an individual contributor, right? Whether you're an outside third-party resource that people are interacting with, it doesn't matter. That's the beauty of the concept of leadership is to your point, right? Being your best self each and every day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Well, Barry, thanks so much again for being a great guest, for sharing some really golden nuggets. How can people um, find you, connect with you and um, potentially engage with you and your business? What's the best way? Lots of different ways. I got a pretty unique last name, so I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. We have a company page on LinkedIn, Anfield Business Consultants. Also have a Baz2343 handle on Instagram, Anfield LC on Instagram. Obviously, I'm available on Facebook. We have a company page on Facebook. We have a leadership group on Facebook, which is probably one of the most engaging places people can go to learn about the conversations we're always having about leadership. We have some case studies there for people to understand and reflect upon whether they, you know, click something inside of them that they can relate to similar situations. We have a number of different training guides available, but the easiest way is is just go to our website, anfieldbusinessconsultants.com, click on the book consultation or send a message button, and that ends up in my inbox. So, Look forward to hearing from anyone who has any questions. And I always say to people, you never know what comes out of a conversation, just like the one you and I are having today. So it's it's often the best 15 or 30 minutes that people ultimately ever spend uh, of their valuable time. Absolutely. All right. Uh, this was Ta- Tatiana Sawyer. I talked to Tatiana. And today I had a conversation with Barry Molesdale. We talk about leadership and next week where I'm going to have another great episode for you. So stay tuned and I'll talk to you soon.